Good evening, everybody. Hello. Hello. Good hello. evening. Hello. All right. Good evening. I am Nadja. I will be your facilitator this evening for the WaterWise class. We have Keto as our awesome instructor. He has a lot of information for you this evening. So stay tuned. We will um, have a lot going on. <laughs> so pay attention to your screen right now. We have our donation QR code up. This class is free, but we do, you know, kindly happily uh, take donations. So without further further ado, I'm going to turn the class over to Keto. And any questions you have, you can put it into the chat and I'll make sure I'll get it to Keto during the question and answer session. Good evening, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. Welcome. Uh, it feels like spring is kind of finally here, maybe, sort of. Uh, man, what an April. Um, those 80 degree days kind of threw us off for a minute and then we got cold, cold, cold. But now the weekend's looking good. I'm excited about the sun. Um, so today I'm... Uh, the intention of today is to talk about a few things related to like kind of all things watering and gardening, right? So we're going to be talking about um, water conservation practices. Well, initially, like kind of what's the baseline of what plants need to grow and some like fundamentals of watering in the garden. Uh, we'll get into some conservation strategies, um, different tools for watering and different techniques. Um, and then we will get into talking about rainwater collection systems a little bit and the different options for different styles of rainwater collection systems. Um, and then finally, uh, we'll just kind of hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end uh, to open it up for questions and things of that sort. Um, so if you do have questions as we go along, um, please direct them to the chat. We got a pretty good sized group here today. Naja is going to be managing the chat for us. Um, and she'll kind of uh, look for vocal pauses or whatever when I can jump in and, uh, you know, where she can jump in and if I'm not talking too much. She can let me know what you guys have questions about and we can talk about it. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and jump into the slides. Just so you know, we are recording today. So this will be available on our YouTube channel for future reference. Um, and we also will share the slides so you can use that as a resource, uh, you know, for reference later down the road, too. So. Being water wise, water conservation, rainwater catchment, and irrigation systems. These are the, this is our, our old farm site when we used to be over by the MGM Grand um, and a bunch of watering cans. You can see that one, the green one on the end, we kind of hacked. Funny. Okay, well, let's start out with uh, some of the basics. Um, Generally speaking, um, we're going to talk first. We're going to talk about seeds. So when we're growing seeds, um, they uh, whether we're starting them indoors or when we're either or we're, we're starting them out in the garden, um, seeds need to be kept consistently moist until they germinate. Um, so some some seeds will take just a few days to germinate. Some will you know some are really really quick. Um, and then things like carrots, for example, uh, may take up to two weeks. Um, so, you know, uh, just to note that like in the in your kind of practices of watering, um, you'll have more success if you stay, you know, pay attention to keeping that soil wet all the time during that period when we're just trying to get the, those seeds to germinate. After that, it changes. We don't want to 
after those seeds start to mature, we don't want to drown them um, because we know that air is important to the roots development. Um, one, you know, one thing to note, uh, particularly about carrots, one little trick or technique that some people use on a, you know, when you're on a smaller scale is um, you can water, if you're planting carrot seeds, you can plant them, water them really well, and then cover them with like a piece of cardboard or a piece of plywood or something, put some bricks on it. Um, because we know that there's like that extended period of, you know, them needing time to soak up the water and they just take that, you know, they take their good old time to germinate. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, just that way it acts somewhat as a mulch and you can wait, you know, a week, week and a half and take it up. So you don't have to, it, it kind of saves you the necessity of watering every, you know, every day just to keep those them wet because they're so slow to move, so to speak. After germination, generally all garden plants, and this applies to also perennials, and it also applies to like, you know, ornamental things, but uh, also applies to annual vegetable crops that uh, we are, we all know, uh, know and love, require, generally speaking, one inch of water a week. That's like the kind of standard uh, that, you know, that's the, that's, you'll see that referenced in books a lot. Um, it's more of a kind of rule of thumb. Um, how do you know what one inch of water is? I, I prefer to think of it more in the terms of one thorough watering one time a week. Um, and this is, uh, and this is part of the conservation strategy. Like, you know, some things, it, it particularly later in the, in the season, um, you know, it might be, might, things might dry out quicker, but earlier in the year, especially now, you may not even worry about um, actually watering. Like we're not, we're not thinking, you know, out in our gardens, we're just getting cold crops in the ground and we don't really need, with all this rain we've been having, we don't think, need to think about um, actually, you know, getting out there with our hoses that much right now, other than getting those seeds going. But those, any of those cold crop plants that we might've put in the ground, that little bit of rain is going to keep them going probably, you know, for another week or two. But it, so it's not, um, it's a, it's a, it's a guideline. One inch a week is a guideline. It is definitely not, um, uh, you know, you don't, you have to pay attention because you don't want to overwater your plants. Um, another piece uh, to just to consider uh, that we're talking about in this slide in particular is that um, it's not the not only the, the seeds and the plants that we're thinking about when we're managing soil in the garden, um, but we are also trying to manage the life in the soil. Um, so, you know, if if water, if there happens to be standing water or oversaturation in the soil for an extended period of time, um, that's going to affect the quality of the life in the soil. So there's all kinds of beneficial organisms in the soil that, you know, work alongside or pro uh, provide benefit to the plants that we're trying to grow. And if we don't provide a favorable environment for them um, uh, by limiting their the air in the soil uh, by virtue of overwatering, then, uh, then that's probably. Um, I did show a few pictures of rain, rain gauges here. Uh, that's another kind of uh, way to kind of get a sense of how much rain we're getting into the ground. Um, it's a good way of, it's a good, um, you know, gives us a sense of like, it felt like it was a lot of rain, but sometimes rain, you know, especially sometimes we get those rains that just kind of blast through and it seemed like it was a heavy rain, but the gar you go out to the garden and, um, and you do a little bit of uh, investigation and you might find that the soil, the water didn't actually penetrate too much. So a rain gauge will give you, give you a little bit of a sense of that. Um, if the, if the soil tends to dry out too much between watering, you may need to water um, more to get that water to penetrate down to the ideal six inches. Um, this is more particularly a part, uh, important as the, the summer goes on, we get more warm weather, um, we get those, those really long hot days, we're talking about June and July. Um, oftentimes, the soil may appear, appear dry uh, uh, or dry upon initial application but uh so like or and or if you water you may water and it looks like it's wet um 
And then, uh, but if you do, if you stick your finger in it, uh, in the soil, then you can see, you know, the soil may, pen the water may penetrate just a couple inches down, um, but below that, it'll be really dry. So that's a case for, that's kind of where, you know, where that kind of playing around with trying to get that uh, really deep penetration of the water is going to be a helpful thing. So um, I li just like, I, I guess this is one of the tools that I, I would say that is, uh, or one of the, you know, whatever, uh, techniques that's really valuable to just get a sense of what your soil needs, uh, particularly in the hot dry months, is to just stick your finger in the soil or peel back the, take your hand and just peel back the soil a little bit and see actually how far that water is actually penetrated down. Um, and in, that'll help you make, you know, some educated uh, decisions on how, um, how, if you need to apply water, more water and or not. So, you know, basically it's a balancing act with watering. You're gonna water, you were trying to think about um, watering just enough, not too much and not too little. So if we're watering too much, um, too much water prevents roots from having access to air. Uh, it also, too much water uh, ultimately can provide a favorable environment for, uh, you know, rotting or mold, or mold around the soils. Uh, it could contribute to, um, in, in certain crops like uh, and things in the cucumber family or the like watermelons and squashes, um, it can contribute to the presence of powdery mildew. Um, shallow rooted plant, you know, essentially, you know, part of that is uh, shallow rooted plants may need to be watered more often. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Too little water um, will cause plants to have low vigor. They'll look a little wilty. They may look a little stunted. Um, you know, uh, they may get to a certain size and not just, not, they just be, you know, it's been, so like say, you know, you just plant, it's uh, it's May 1st. And just this morning you, you pay, you, uh, or actually it's May 4th. But this morning you, uh, you just planted your cold crops and, you don't have water access at your site and a month goes by and you haven't gotten back there to water and they don't, they just don't look like they, they're alive, but they're not really growing much. And they, that's, uh, that may be one factor is that they just don't have enough water to kind of expand and grow. So they're going to be kind of stunted. Um, uh, low, uh, inconsistent or too little water can also lead to some disease issues a good example, a good, very common example of that um, is blossom end rot on tomatoes, which is, you can see in this Ill, uh, image here. Um, so it, as it turns out, blossom end rot is actually kind of related to a calcium deficiency, but it's all, you know, it's tied to access to water. So the, the plant needs the water to pull the calcium up into the plant, you know, for its particular needs and without that access, then we're going to have issues with um, things like blo blossom and rot. Um, another factor, and this is where it gets a little slightly more complicated um, and to, to really get to know, uh, a pause for getting to know the different types of crops is that um, there's different, you know, basically some crops are shallow rooted some crops are quote unquote medium rooted and some crops are more deep rooted. So deep rooted plants may be more tolerant of, of infrequent watering, whereas shallow rooted crops will respond quite quickly um, when they don't have adequate water. So shallow rooted plants would be corn, beans, uh, broccoli, you know, things in the broccoli family, cabbage, kale, collards. Um, the Anything, any of the baby greens, uh, lettuces, definitely. Um, some of the herbs are, I, did, I didn't include on the list here, but herbs would be included in there. Um, some flowering annuals, there's lots of different types of flowering annuals, but as a general rule, like flowering annuals may be on that, that kind of end of the spectrum of shallow rooted. Um, 
and then you know uh you can see the list here but medium rooted would be cucumbers turnips summer squash carrots peas etc flowering perennials um and then deep rooted plants are going to be much more able to kind of care for themselves i didn't i was really focused in this presentation on um on vegetable crop production but i will note here you know just in terms of like you know if it's whether it be our fruiting crops like uh our berry bushes, uh, raspberries and blackberries and currants and things of that sort, or our fruit trees, um, they, you know, oh, they have the benefit of, of more extensive root systems uh, as a general rule. And um, once they get more established, I mean, trees can take, th you know, two to three years to really start to get a good established root system. But as they get more, as any of these plants get more established root systems that can dig deeper into the soil and go deeper into the ground, they have access to the water at that part of the water table and which makes it a lot easier for them to survive and thrive. Um, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't pay attention to the watering needs of those plants as well. Um, and uh, we'll talk about some techniques related to that as well as we go on. How are we doing on questions? Well, we don't have any questions just yet. Okay. So just as a just uh, as a, a good technique that I like to recommend for watering to to get that good penetration of water um, would be kind of a water weight water uh, you know method so to speak uh, so you water a spot until you see the surface of the soil glisten and it you know looks like you're getting a little bit of puddling and then you move on to watering another part of the garden. Um, and this is clearly if you're hand watering, um, and water that, do the same thing till it starts to glisten. And then you make your way back to the first spot. So you're working your way through the entire area that you're intending to water, watering it fully, go moving on, moving on, and then looping back and doing it at least one more time to get. So once that water is penetrated, some you're just you're putting more water on top of that to penetrate deeper. And we're looking to get down to that six inch mark. And that's where, again, you're going to use your finger test as uh, to help you figure out if you've got some good water penetration. Um, now I wanted to share a little video that I, you know, helps. I think he talks a lot about this, uh, describes what I was just talking about, but also has a little bit of image that is, I thought would be helpful. So let me just stop share and I'm going to show you this video real quick. Here in the in-ground bed or even in the raised bed, it's a different equation because you're actually applying the water to the garden if you're hand watering. So then the question remains, how do I know how much I should water? Well, it's going to depend, of course, on a lot of different things. For example, take these tomatoes here. Tomatoes benefit a lot more from a deep, inconsistent watering than a little bit of water every single day. So I'm going to show you how I water these tomatoes, and then I'll show you how I water the corn up there and how that differs. I'm using a water wand here, which I can talk about in a second, but the first thing I want to do is just moisten all the soil because if it's dry, it's been dry for a while, you want to give it a little bit of a hydration before you start pouring it on. So let's do that. I call it the water weight water move. You water, you can see this water starting to run. It needs some time to actually moisten up the soil. There it's starting to get in. Now I can come in with a deeper water. Okay, here we go. Especially if you're using a water wand that puts out quite a bit of water at one time, unlike a little shower hose, then it's a lot easier to actually get the water into the subsoil and can wait a little bit instead of just dumping it all on at once. And with tomatoes, it's a really good idea to water around as well, deep and wide roots. And so watering anywhere from one to two feet even around your tomatoes is going to be a great idea. So how do I now know if I watered enough? Well, what I can do is just brush away my mulch and stick my finger down in here and take a little pull away. And if I take a look, 
I've got water down at least four or five inches, if not more. So I've given it a nice deep water. That's a success. Now, again, you want to just make a note of how long that took to get there and then replicate that the next time you water. There's our example of tomatoes, a plant that wants to be watered deeply, but not necessarily every single day. Now, something like corn, remember, that's a much shallower root system. Beans, again, also a shallow root system. And they will suffer quite a bit from not having water in that shallow root system. So you may want to come in with something like this and water more often, once, even twice a day, especially if you're in a heat wave, and just making sure those roots stay consistently moist. And this is a situation in which, you see on the rest of my beds, I've got a bunch of straw mulch down. I need to put straw mulch down on this as well. The more shallow the root system is, the more sensitive it is to underwatering, the more result you're going to get, the more benefit from having a nice layer of mulch on top of your bed. And so I'm making a little bit of a mistake here in not doing that, which I will remedy as soon as I finish watering this up. Before we get to some of my favorite. Okay. The fact, so that's, you know, I think that gives a pretty good illustration of, of what some good technique to work with. So you do have a few questions about the watering, overwatering, or underwatering. Okay. It's really one question right now from Lauren. She's asking about her uh, basil plant. She says the stem near the soil is almost wood like. Um, I'm not sure if this is, these are due to same issues of the issue in watering. Uh, well, I mean, basil plants will get a little bit as they mature, their stems will get a little bit more woody. Is there, is the plant um, looking unhealthy? You wanna come off mute? Lauren. Okay, read it one more time. It says, my basil plant stem has become almost wood-like. I'm not sure if this, if this is due to the same issue of watering. Anything uh, else? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, if you want to come off, we can just, you know, chat, chime in again on the chat and we can uh, come off mute again later if, if uh, it makes sense. Okay. But I don't, I don't know if I don't see how that would be related to the watering specifically. Okay. And I have another one from Dale. They are asking how, I mean, hi, I got, uh, let's see, has anybody asked about raised bed tips? Okay. I bought three wooden beds on legs last year and nothing I planted did very well. And she says she watered twice a day when it was super hot and uh -huh. was that too much. Yeah. So that, ref that applies to anything that's like a container. So whether it be like beds that are, um, you know, raised beds, but they're like, um, raised off the ground, like on stands, or like you have large pots that you're growing your vegetables in. Typically we're using a combination of like compost and potting mix in those because, uh, topsoil can get really heavy and compacted inside of a container like that. Um, so the, the, you can grow great crops in those. Um, but the, the downside is they, they just tend to dry out pretty quickly. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about mulch later, but that you could play around with, um, mulch. Um, but you will definitely have to, that's, that's definitely one of the downsides of container gardening or any kind of um you know container like situation is that you're going to need to be watering more often so in terms of timing um how often should i water generally once a week thoroughly um as i kind of mentioned before after it seeds of germinated soil you do want your soil to dry out some between waterings um so you know um you don't want to get in a situation where you're like feeling like you need to stay water every day or, um, you know, again, to, to kind of hearkening to referencing back to like not wanting to eliminate any kind of uh, air out of the soil. 
Um, so we're really, um, really trying to have that, you know, that six inch penetration in terms of time of day, um, we're, uh, you know, best case scenario is first thing in the morning. Um, that particularly applies um, in the hottest part of the season. This time of the year it probably doesn't matter as much. Um, but when it gets to be the hardest part of the season, if you're watering like in the middle of the day, like right at noon or at one o'clock, uh, then the it, the water will tend to just evaporate off much quicker. If you water first thing in the morning, it gives the plants some time to actually absorb it before the you know the day really starts to heat up and and it evaporates into the air. Um, that said, if um, if the afternoon or the evening is the only time that you have to water in your garden, that is when you're going to water your garden, like hands down. Like if you like if your garden is not where you live, or um, you know because of other commitments, your job or whatever, you you the only time you can get to watering is in the in the late day or evening. It's not the end of the world. Um, uh, you know the other factor that to consider with water is that uh you know water timing of the day is just that you know we're if we can we're trying to avoid watering in the evening um or better said um you know if we water the leaves in the evening it could be a vector for some of the diseases like the powdery mildew or, or any kind of other fungal kind of or you know that that fungal or otherwise uh bad problems um that could be come about um but you know mother nature rains all times a day and and vegetable garden plants survive just fine um this is just a, a more of kind of best case scenario when we do have control of the situation um these are some things to consider okay great all right we have a couple of more before you move on or do you want to jump in and come Go back for to it. The question? okay so we have a question from Dr. Sean. Um, until the water catchment system is in place, does water from the house faucet have too much calcium content? No. City water is just fine. Um, yeah, city water is, uh, every, you know, I use city water. Uh, the farm, Our farm uses, like many, many farmers use, you know, here in the city, uh, city water is, works just great. Okay, great. Good to know. All right, and we have a question from Edna. Will the water gauge be helpful in between rain events to tell you how deep the water is in the soil? Yes, but putting your finger in the soil is going to give you a more accurate idea of actually how much it penetrated. So I would say both and. You know, a water gauge... Um, I mean, so what you could do, one way of doing it is like, oh, the water gauge says there's one, you know, says there's one inch of rain that we just got, and then go check the soil and see actually what did that one inch of water do for your garden at that time. So it's another kind of measuring tool that you can reference between the two of them. And then maybe if you know, you know, maybe you can start to learn from that, that one inch was adequate, you know, proved to be adequate when I went to look in the garden and I felt the soil, it, it did have that good penetration. Okay. Um, now we're going to get into like some, some watering methods or like tools for watering. So we'll talk about the different, uh, like whether it be the different types of hose, you know, things that you would connect to your water, uh, your city water system, whether that be from your house or otherwise. Um, but uh, like sprinklers, sprayers, soakers, drip irrigation, I'm going to show some more information on that. Um, and then, you know, if you have, uh, you have a rain barrel or a field barrel or water collection tanks, you know, some options related to those. Um, I want to, while we're on this slide, I do want to talk a little bit more about what a field barrel is, or it's a term that we kind of made up, but essentially um, a field barrel is if you don't have access to city water, but occasionally uh, it's convenient, you know, you can borrow your neighbor's hose um, and fill up a tank. So this is basically a water reservoir uh, for 
if you don't have access to any kind of water on your garden, a field barrel is a very simple way if you have occasional access to water to, um, you know, like from, from the city, you know, from a neighbor or whatever, that you would fill up the barrel and then um, that's going to kind of hold you over for your watering needs for uh, for a period of time. So you would borrow the neighbor's hose, fill up, you know, fill up the garden, water the whole garden. I'm sorry, fill up the barrel, water the whole garden, and then you have a reserve of water in the barrel to to use next time. You know, you get to get there out out there and water. So it saves a little bit of labor um, when you're dealing with that circumstance. Um, so, um, <clears throat> water in cans, uh, this is, uh, going to apply to, uh, uh, useful for situations where you have access to city water and you do not have access to city water. Um, it, it's a really, uh, useful tool for get, giving a good gentle rain, um, especially if you planted a new seed bed. So you can see this this shower like head on uh, these watering cans. Um, that's kind of ideal for new seed beds. Um, it doesn't, you know, it's not hard pressure, so it's not blasting around the soil when you're watering. Um, there's many different uh, types of watering cans out in the world. Um, I happen to really like these dram ones. I, I think they're kind of ergonomic and helpful just as a tool and. Um, you know, this orange one down in the left-hand corner. Uh, so I would highly recommend those. Um, in this situation, when we when we get to talking a little bit more about the rainwater collection systems, whether you're catching from a, a roof of a building or a freestanding structure, unless you have power, even if you're filling up a 275 gallon tank that's on a stand, you're still gonna not have that much water pressure. Um, so watering cans are still going to be your best option to move the water from the collection system into the garden. Uh, next would be oscillating sprinklers. Um, this is a really useful tool for watering a blanket area but it is indiscriminate. So it is not very efficient with using water. So in terms of like, if you're trying to keep your water bill down, um, you know, oscillating sprinklers would probably be not the most optimal way to water your garden because it's watering the paths. It's watering, you know, the fence. It's watering, you know, it's just watering everything. And it's, um, it's a helpful tool. I use it at home for my vegetable garden. Uh, and I'm actually getting ready to do to do drip irrigation this year, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But um, I've used this in my garden. It is like it's like kind of a set it you know set it up, let it just water the whole garden. It is useful, but it's very inefficient. Um, you can, there are, and I think this is one of those that you can actually, you, there are ones that you can adjust the depth, the, um, how wide the spray is, as well as how far it oscillates. So that's a, a, a little bit of adjustments that can help you be a, more efficient with how you, um, you know, actually where the water is going. Um, but in the end, you know, it's just a reminder that we we really only need to water at the base of where the plants are. We don't need to water the entire garden. We even we don't even, especially when plants are young, we don't even need to water necessarily if we're just, like say we just planted a four by eight raised bed of collard greens. We really only need to water right at the collard green spot. If we're watering the entire garden, we're also giving the opportunity of, of weed seeds to germinate. So. But at the same time, we don't want to dry out the soil. So there, it's, a, it's a game, a little bit of a game, um, you know, and probably the most simple thing is just to water the whole bed. Um, but there's some things to play around with that. Impact sprinklers. Um, this works well on larger scales. Uh, uh, it's basically, you know, if you know, like similar to what are, you know, used for lawns or for golf greens and things of like that. So it's a sprayer that goes 
and they it goes a long distance. Again, not super efficient, um, probably not ideal for most applications for vegetable gardens, but it will work. They do have adjustments for how far they will go. They can go, you know, you can go a very thin area, just like, or it goes wide, you know. So um, it's a tool. It's not, I would say this would be not the most efficient, um, but something, you know, that may have certain applications in the vegetable garden. Wobble sprinklers. Um, these, uh, even though they're kind of akin to the impact sprayer and uh, the oscillators, they tend to water in a in a like more contained. Uh, so, like if you're trying to water a specific area, they can have kind of slightly more contained footprint of like anywhere from you know eight to twelve feet, or maybe slightly more, but somewhere in the neighborhood of there, eight to twelve feet, um, where they're just it's just spinning round and round and and shooting out water in a circular pattern. Um, so if you're trying to establish, you know, that may work uh, and that's just kind of thinking about um, how you're trying to efficiently get the water to the area. So again, it's not, it's gonna water both the paths and the garden beds. It is inefficient, but in certain applications, especially if you have a larger garden that's bigger than eight by 12 feet or eight to 12 feet, then you know, moving one of these wobblers type style sprinklers down the road um, could be a useful tool. We definitely use these at the KGD farm. Um, we, we have three, like we'll have them um, three kind of in, in succession. So we'll have three of them con connected with about a 10 or 12 foot hose between them. So the, the spray patterns are overlapping and um, that works out really well for the way that our bed systems are. But these are like each of our fields. We have our field, our our whole farm is kind of broken up into approximately 50 foot by 50 foot beds. So for that size of ap application, it works out pretty reasonably for us. Again, not very efficient. So if, if cost of water is a concern for you, not one of the ones that you want to, you know, you would want to seek other options as, as better, better applications. The water wand. So I guess, wait, before I move on, so um, I jump, so there's the watering can, works for city water and for rainwater collection systems, uh, impact sprinklers, wobblers, and uh, oscillators all are going to need water pressure for the city. So you cannot, there's not a situation where you have a rain, unless you have power and a pump, you cannot use rainwater that's collected um you cannot use it uh, like if it's in a 275 gallon tank or one of those or uh, or a rain barrel the only way that you can move that water is with some kind of pump which requires power unless and i guess there's one exception i'll talk about in a minute but uh just so moving on here to the watering wand this, I would say, if you have city water, uh, is is really a really a good, a very useful tool um, because it really imitates. Uh, it's similar to the watering can, but with a little bit more pressure behind it. It's a way to get the water right to the roots of the plant. So plants don't need to be, you know, it's though it may give us some satisfaction to water the whole plant and make it look, make the whole garden look glistening like a fresh rain. And it's sunny out and you get to love your, you know, the garden looks beautiful in that way. The reality is the plants really just need water at the roots. So this helps us with the wand, we could hold the water right at the base of the plant and has it have it penetrate into the root zone. It's also helps be efficient with um, distributing that water. So we're uh, watering right, you know, if we're watering new transplants, for instance, we're watering at the base of each transplant instead of, you know, watering indiscriminately over the entire garden bed. And then there's, you know, many different options of garden sprayers out there. Uh, the one on the left is the one that you can open up and it's a circular pattern. It can be finer, which with the more intense spray, or as you open it up, it become, becomes a wider spray. Um, those, they both, you know, they both have, they both work. They're not as um, use, I would say they don't work quite as well as the watering wand. 
um, they uh, the in some cases the you know the stream can if the water part you know if you have it on certain settings the the stream of the water can be really strong which can push around the soil if it's if you're watering freshly planted seeds then you may be blasting the seeds around so um, we're really looking for some ways to do more of a gentle watering so these have their place but they're you know not the top of the list how are we doing on questions no questions yet okay um soaker hoses so this is a really good option for watering right in the root zone of um of your vegetable garden so they're efficient in that way that they're not blasting water everywhere they're more very specific that they're watering you would place these right in the base uh right at the base of the plant um there's basically there's soaker hoses and then there's drip irrigation systems um so soaker hoses are basically made out of recycled tires um, and so they're basically this very porous rubber um, that just kind of drips out of all you can see all these pores that the water is just coming out of. It's not um, the way that it's built that it, if there's any if the you know it's a hose so you have to really straighten it tight on the ground to have good soil contact. And if the water goes if the hose goes up or down it, or or it bends or sticks up at any point. Um, it it will water inconsistently. It'll tend to water more heavily on the low end, low ends of where the hose is, and um, less on, on where it's sticking up in the air, uh, just because of the you know the nature of it doesn't have kind of um, quote unquote any engineering to it, uh, so to speak. So whereas drip irrigation is um, got holes at very specific uh, distances in the drip line. Um, and they're engineered to drip the same amount of water out of every hole. So you get very consistent watering. Um, there are systems, so now I'm gonna talk about drip irrigation system. They are, you know, basically the soaker hose is kind of the cousin of a drip irrigation. Um, and so it requires some of the same uh, things to, that, that you should connect to it. Um, to make it work. So basically, um, drip irrigation is where you are setting up, this is like, in this image here, it's a, a field where it was, you know, it looks like a 20 foot by 20 foot garden. And then they have uh, these drip, they have from the spigot goes a filter. So that's important. Uh, there are, are also low flow drip irrigation kits that do work with rainwater catchment systems this one in particular you know some of them need the what need the pressure and you're going to need the pressure for the soaker hose uh, of a city water or a pump for the soaker hose but so first we're just talking about this the setup of the drip irrigation so there's the city water goes to a filter and then a PSI regulator, basically the city water is at a certain pressure and you don't want too much, you only want a specific pressure. If too much pressure is in the line, then it's going to uh, bust holes in the line possibly. And then that goes to what's called a header. So it's a, it's a, a solid hose line. And then you connect, the, you punch holes in the solid hose line and you would connect the drip, uh, the drip line to those. And you can set this up where you have a header going, you know, you have to figure out how to, uh, you know, make this work for your particular garden. Um, this is one of the, probably the most e efficient watering system. Um, most larger scale farms use these um, out, out, out in the world today. Uh, it's, uh, it's definitely a very useful tool. Um, it, it the downs and so here's an image of of uh, what it kind of looks like and you can see um, the drips you can see at the base of each of these plants these are the the plants were spaced consistent with with a spacing on the drip lines so there's a you know a slow drip going at the base of each one of those plants helping it be super efficient with the way it, you know you know helping it the way it you know is getting water to each of the plants 
The big downside to drip irrigation is it's a big sk spaghetti of hoses everywhere. So if you have concerns about vandalism or if you're working with raised beds or like system, you know, maybe your garden is like unique where you have one bed here and one bed there. And so it it's more kind of designed for open fields or a dedicated area. This is the 20 by 20 garden. This is the 50 by 50 garden. Um, much better in that application. Whereas like if, it, if you have more of, uh, you know, creative uh, curving pathways and, you know, a bed here and a bed there, it's just going to not work. It, you can get it, you can make it, you know, you can definitely apply drip irrigation to that situation, but there's just going to be kind of hoses running everywhere, which is maybe not desirable. So we do have some questions about the drip irrigation. I will start here with Michael. He says, how much pressure can the low pressure version of the drip irrig irrigation system handle? Is that something that I will be able to find in the pressure regulators manual? Right. Um, so we're gonna talk about that in just one minute. So hold, hold that thought. Um, uh, okay, any other questions before we move on? Yes. Any tips for installing drip irrigation into raised beds? I'm not sure I'm not sure how to connect from the outside faucet to the drip irrigation to raised beds. Right. So you would run basically you would run a hose from your hot from the water source to what the you know the ideal scenario would be you would run a hose to what what the most logical spot to be to make to put your header which would be that that line that's going across the top here in this image so you would figure out like based on how your raised beds are set up do you do you know maybe you do a header for each raised bed and then you run another you know you do a split it a split hose from the main to the, you know, from, so you do uh, main water line hose to maybe some shutoffs and then a couple other hoses. One hose goes to the header for this raised bed. The other hose goes to the header for this raised bed. And then, you know, and then you do the drip lines off of the header. So you maybe would do two or three or four drip lines in that raised bed as an example. Um, there are kits and I, there, I will be sharing some resources on how to like where to source drip irrigation and stuff later. Um, and there are some kits that are designed for smaller scale, scale, scale gardens out in the world. Um, so, um, and I guess if you need further kind of consultation about like how to go about designing your drip irrigation system, we could probably set up a phone call at some point. Okay. Um, and actually, you know, I should have I should have clicked ahead sooner. This is a good illustration of kind of what you might do. Um, this is actually a soaker hose kit. Uh, that's kind of how I was saying. You know, it's the same kind of concept, uh, the drip and the soaker. But this is you know a cost effective. This, the pricing is going to be. This is a, this picture is a couple a year or two old, so maybe the pricing might have gone up a little bit. But for you know the equivalent of do they tell you what size this is intended for? So four 25 foot rows, it looks like a total of hundred linear feet of hose. So it looks like those beds are approximately 25 feet, you know, estimating based on this illustration, but you could get a kit like this for somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 or 50 bucks. Um, and, you know, that probably is something similar that this would kind of, this kind of design setup would maybe work out as a good application for uh, the raised bed situation. Okay. Um, so here is the uh, the instruction yeah. manuals that. Hold come... on, one sec. One sec. No, go ahead. Oh, go yeah, ahead. one more irrigation. We'll just get this one before we move on. One more question about that is: Do does the uh, drip irrigation work with a rain catchment system, and does it need a pump? Dun, da, da, da. Let's <laughs> talk about bucket irrigation kits. There we are. Okay, so um, this these are this is a what's called a low flow irrigation kit. So 
It is a low, it's a drip irrigation kit that is designed specifically for low to no water pressure. So it's, it's actually, it was, um, this company, uh, design this to work in uh, developing countries with little access to water um, and as a as a tool and basically a lot of what they do is using five gallon buckets and these these emitters and these fittings and everything but you can use the same stuff and attach it to a 55 gallon drum or a 275 gallon tank um, and they work out, they they work pretty well. They do not require power or pressure or added pressure. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, this is, the company is called Chapin Living Waters. Um, you can see the contact info there. And I'll, it's also, so again, I'll be sharing my slides later so you can reference this later, um, but it's also on my last slide. Um, so it's a little bit, they don't have, so like their the website goes to you know their uh, their nonprofit organization and the work that they're doing, um, but then you can find the store if you go to the website and um, gives you more details on how to buy the kit with all the pieces uh, for the low flow irrigation. So the difference between this the drip irrigation in this kit and um, and this one is that the engineering again is designed specifically to, um, to take on you know water at, that, at a very low pressure and still emit um, in a consistent way. Um, so um, I know of uh, you know several gardens over the years that have used these and had good success with them. Um, this is also if you are these you can kind of set. It, you could also you could set these up on a raised bed system very nicely with a bucket at each raised bed, and then you're just filling the bucket and it slowly drips in. So super efficient with the water. Um, so definitely, uh, you know, a good resource. Uh, this the shape in living waters. Um, and here's some illustrations of the the kits in action. Basically, you set you know on the left hand side you got the buckets hanging um, with the the header is going directly to the lines, uh, the drip lines on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, they have them set up. Um, looks like they're getting those buckets set up, but you can see the lines um, with the headers at the, at the, at the, bear, the header at the very back there. Okay, before we move on from irrigation tools, techniques, et cetera, are there any other questions? Uh, there is a question. What is the difference between the drip, drip irrigation hoses and drip tape? Uh, drip tape, it's in the same, they're cousins. It's the same, same concept, drip tape and drip line. So um, there, uh, there are many kinds, like there are also, um, there are also drip lines that are more designed for um, with different kinds of emitters, like with little, with some of them, they have ones with like little sprayers. Um, they have ones that are engineered at, at shorter distances and longer distances. So there's like, there's lots of variety out there of in, in different applications. Uh, and you can, you know, uh, you can check out trickle ease or, um, you know, again, I will look at the resource page at the end, but there, there's, you know, you can order a catalog and, and kind of peruse the different options of the, in the different applications. Okay. Another question, which is more efficient, uh, I guess, for saving on your water bill, soaker hose or drip irrigation? Drip irrigation. Okay. And the last question, can one utilize lawn fence staples to hold the lines in place? And remove them and store them for the winter. Yes. Do the lines crack in our cold winters? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Definitely. Uh, in terms of maintenance, you would be. Uh, that's another kind of. Um, is another thing is like you you should you need to take it you need to take the hose up every year and store it uh, if you to to extend the life of it. Um, okay. 
that was it with the questions on irrigation. Okay. So now let's spend a little time talking about water conservation. So now that, so essentially um, the garden, you just watered the garden. So how do you, um, how do you keep that water in the soil or, or how do you uh, encourage the plants to use that water the most efficiently? Um, how do you dry, prevent, you know, like as the question says on the page here, uh, how do you prevent it from drying out too quickly, right? Um, the shortest answer here is mulch, 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 mulch. Mulch is, um, is a super useful tool for vegetable gardeners. Everybody should be mulching their gardens um, for a few different reasons. But when I say mulch, um, specifically for the veg for the vegetable garden, I'm not talking I'm talking more specifically about straw and leaves. And we'll, you know, we'll show some other options here, but um uh shredded paper. Um and then, well, there's some uh, landscape fabric. So all those can help keep the moisture in the soil. Um, when I say the word mulch, often people think of, or when somebody says the word mulch, you know, people think of wood chips immediately because that's kind of the standard. Um, wood chips really uh, are not really ideal for the annual vegetable garden um, because we're turning over the soil from year to year and, uh, the the wood chips will slowly decay in the soil um but you know it's hard what if you put some down it's hard they get they it can kind of uh it can cause problems one um as they decay they can tie up nitrogen in the soil um they take a lot longer to break down and if if they kind of get mixed in a little bit of the soil where you have this kind of partially soil but a little chips mixed in um can it's just really not an ideal tilth or like soil texture for um for tr when you're trying to start new seeds so um uh, uh wood chips are a great application in the garden in perennial situations so whether it be around your trees or um any of your other perennial crops berries uh you know, asparagus, uh, rhubarb, things of that sort. Um, they help keep the uh, weeds in check and they are re really great at uh, keeping that moisture in the soil. As And in addition, for trees in particular, as the, they decay, um, the, the decomposing wood is a really beneficial, uh, provides some beneficial fungus environment for trees in particular um so let's take some take a look at some images of these things um uh so actually well before we get into that let's talk about how deep um uh when we're talking about perennials we really want to do a really heavy thick layer um as much as four to six inches uh, deep, and that really helps suppress weeds. Really good with you know, lets allows the water to still penetrate. Um, and you know, when we get a rain or we're watering the garden, uh, but also slows the evaporation of the water, as we've been talking about. Um, but we're just never when we're applying it that deep, we never want it to be right up against the plants because uh, that could just be a vector for. Uh, decay or also kind of encourage um, critter activity. Um, when we're mulching around vegetable plants, it's more, I, I wrote two, and I'm second guessing myself, I wrote three to four inches here, but it could be as little as two to two, two to three inches, but just like a good solid layer that you can't see the, the soil below. Um, usually you're applying mulch um, once, once the seeds are germinated, um, or the plant has, uh, gotten a time to develop a little bit, or you're just like, if you say you, um, you know, you just planted and you want, you like, we we're talking about that scenario earlier where you just planted your, it's May 4th and you're, you just planted your vegetables, your cold crops this morning, you could just leave 
you know, mulch all of the soil excepting, you know, a three or four inch ring around the plant. And as it matures a little bit, then you can like push the mulch a little bit closer to the base of the plant. But we're just trying to avoid any kind of vector for um, or creating a habitat for any kind of critters that might find that a habitable environment. All right, so here's some images uh, to illustrate, you know, um, uh, the concepts of, or like just to give a visual on what the different types of mulches might look in action, look like in action. Um, straw is probably one of the primo uh, mulch options out there um, because the nature of it being so thin <clears throat> uh, really uh, it, it doesn't mat like for, for like for example leaves if you are you mulching with full leaves then they can become a mat and actually the water will slough off the side and it can kind of be a negative thing um uh but the the only thing so you know definitely if you're gonna want to stop for a second so straw is so there's there's straw bales and then there's hay bales. And just as a reminder, hay bales are for feed. So hay is for horses, right? So that just remember hay is for horses. And that is because the seed end of the, of the grain is in the hay. So we definitely don't want hay because we don't want to introduce those seeds into our garden. And that actually can be a downside of straw sometimes because it, it's hard to get some straw without some seeds in it. Um, you probably have, I definitely have seen, you know, straw bales I've had sitting around for a while and then all the seeds start to germinate and you got this grass sticking out the top of the straw bale. Um, or like I mulched my garlic with straw last fall and there's a bunch of grass popping up through it. And that's because of the seeds that's present in the straw. So not ideal for that purpose, but, um, otherwise really great mulch option. Um, other downside of it is typically you're going to probably have to pay for it uh, or purchase it. Um, there are certain times of the year that, you know, that straw bales are around, like after in the fall, after um, some of the holidays, Thanksgiving and uh, Halloween, you know, straw bales might be out um, on the curb because people aren't using them for, for decoration anymore. And so that's a good time to snatch them up and maybe keep them around for mulching in future times. Leaves, um, leaves are great. Uh, the biggest thing about leaf mulch is that you want to shred it before you apply it to avoid that matting that I was discussing earlier. So you don't want the leaves to be in these big matted sheets that if you pull it back, the soil might be dry below, but you want to take your lawnmower um, and just run over them a few times so they're more finer cut cut up into into smaller pieces. Uh, but uh, it's a great you know a great reason to collect leaves in the fall. Either you know collect and store them from your own trees around your house. And you know we have a competition in my neighborhood uh, where who can get the most bags of you know bags of leaves from going up driving up and down the street and and stockpiling them. Uh, and uh, also great to have around for um, for your compost pile as well. So leaf, you know, bag leaves are a, always a useful tool, a useful thing to have around in the garden. Um, shredded paper, yeah, it works. Uh, and but it just kind of looks trashy. And if it dries out and it's a windy day, you're gonna have shredded paper blowing all over your lot yard. So for the most part, I really wouldn't recommend it as a mulch. Maybe it's a decent application um, for your compost pile. You know, paper has been processed and bleached. Uh, you know, I don't, it's uh, generally, you know, not too big of a deal to put paper in your compost pile, but I wanted to show it as an example. Works okay, not great. Um, so here is a, a technique that we've been using a lot at the Keep Growing Detroit Farm is uh, is planting with landscape fabric as a as a kind of permanent mulch, so to speak. Um, and so basically, you use a, you 
you we use a torch and we burn holes in the in the plastic at specific intervals based on kind of the spacing that we use at the garden um and uh uh, it's so you the, the up, so this really pairs well with drip irrigation so you can actually if you have long straight rows um that's also kind of kind of a necessity for you know it doesn't work for every application you could cut pieces to work out well for something like a four by eight raised bed um but uh the kind of downside of it is it, it, in a rain situation, if it's raining out, um, it the water will penetrate through, but not great. So that's where it really works best in combination with drip irrigation lines underneath. But it is a really useful tool. Uh, it's been and it, one of the biggest parts of it um, actually being useful is just is helping with weed suppression. So if you have big weed pressure at your at your spot, um definitely something to look into okay before now we're getting ready um to talk about we're, we're this is kind of the beginning of the conversation about rainwater collection um and and just having an understanding of actually how much water your garden needs um, there's some we're going to do some math in a minute here but before we jump into that do we have any more questions yes we do First question from Dr. Sean, uh, if she was to use the shredded paper, how would the ink affect the crops? Would that be concerning? Yeah, um, it would be shredded, again, shredded office paper. Most ink these, inks these days, I think, are um, soy-based and not toxic definitely do not use like magazine paper so this would be like your standard white you know white paper um but yeah i wouldn't i'm not necessarily concerned about ink. Okay. okay next question from odessa i've never mulched my vegetable garden in warmer climates is it necessary in colder climates to mulch the vegetable garden you don't have to mulch it's a tool so it's a water conservation tool um so it's not a necessity but in the context of the conversation about strategies to um you know maximize the water that you're putting down and minimize the need to water then mulch is a really useful tool it also is a very very useful tool in weed suppression it also is really beneficial to soil uh, and the life of the soil because it protects, uh, particularly during winter months, it protects the soil from erosion and compaction. Um, so, but there are many gardens and farms out in the world that do not use mulch and, uh, and grow vegetables very successfully. Uh, it's just more of a tool for the toolbox. Okay, great. Next question. Um... Do you know of any local resources for straw mulch? Straw. Uh, sometimes it, it's, I don't have a consistent vendor. So sometimes there's vendors in the Eastern market, not consistently. Usually it's kind of like, um, you know, seasonally, at, like at the times of year when, you know, during holidays and things like that, you know, like during the fall holidays. Um, but at this time of year, I would say probably the pet stores, um, uh, are going to have bedding, um, yeah, feeds like feed stores and or pet stores, probably like there, I think there's, I don't know. So, and, and also, uh, farm and garden centers. So pollen sons, I am pretty sure, um, they're one of our favorite uh, Detroit uh, landscape companies that has compost and wood chips and all kinds of stuff. I believe that they have straw bales. Um, yeah, Denise says she gets hers from her landscape company. So okay, right on. Okay, anybody else? 
Uh, yep, we have a few more. Uh, can you use can you use grass clippings as mulch? Yes, great point. I actually should add a slide for that. Um, so grass is great. It'll decompose in place. It's a source of nitrogen. Um, you know, uh, you just again, you just don't want it to put right up on the plants, but you can, you know, bag it like put a bag instead of using your mulching uh, mower, put the bag on and collect it. And I do that. I I'm glad I am good point. I'm sorry I didn't include a slide on that. It's an excellent uh, excellent way to uh, another application of mulch. Okay, great. And you mentioned collecting leaves from the houses in your neighborhood. Now, do you only collect the leaves from the lawns without uh, chemicals? No, I mean, we're not, uh, it's leaves. So the trees aren't going to necessarily be a, you know, a concern if, so if like my neighbor is using chemicals for his lawn, I probably wouldn't be so worried about the leaves coming off of his trees. And I'm just, I'm not, I'm not mowing his lawn to collect. I'm like just, when he puts his bags out for city to pick up, I'm just driving the bag and picking them up. Okay. Now is mixing mulch with compost a good idea if my mulch starts matting? Uh, well, I mean, you can not, that's not going to be a quick way to get the mulch to not mat. You're going to probably, you want to, if the mulch, if the leaves really are, are going to be the issue with matting, if it's, if you're having issues with matting, it's like, you got to just pull those leaves off there and shred them up somehow with your lawnmower or, or in some way like that. Okay. Does burning holes in the fabric cause any issues in the soil? Is there a resource list on the website? Oh, well, that's the question. Does burning holes in the fabric cause any issues in the soil? Yeah, you wouldn't burn them right over the soil. You'd burn them like uh, on the sidewalk or, or you know, uh, on a, you know, put them on a surface just to make your burn hole pattern and then take the fabric and put it on top of the garden and then plant into it. Okay. And would landscape fabric go over the drip irrigation system? Yes. Okay. And do you know how do you, or how do you burn holes into the fabric? Is there a certain technique for that? Right. Um, yeah, so we, the way that we were doing it at the KGD farm is um, one of our farmers took a piece of plywood and made a, a hole burning jig, which basically they just drilled out hole, they used a hole saw and drilled out holes at, you know, I think they want, in this case, it was for tomatoes. So they were on 18 inch spacing and they did a specific pattern and then you could just you know, slide it down and burn a hole like through using the um, the plywood as a template. Okay. okay. Let's see. Let's see if we have any more. Should I be concerned about using leaves since there are so many feral cats around here? <laughs> they use it everywhere and I put down repellent. So should. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, um, I probably wouldn't worry too much. I mean, like cats are going to pee here and there and it's a little bit of nitrogen. Um, not a bad thing necessarily. I mean, if it was like, it's like, you know, cats don't in the garden, if they're going potty outside, they're kind of moving around. They're not going to go to the same spot over and over and over and over and over again. So, um, It'll it, it'll kind of speed up the decomposition of the leaves a little bit. I, I I guess generally speaking, I would not be too concerned. That said, you know it is you know animal feces and are a vector for potential disease. So I would more I guess if I knew that cats peed on that mulch, I would put it in my compost pile and it, 
and it would decompose and address all that stuff. Um, so I guess that's the safer way to, to, to speak to it. Uh, but, you know, um, and definitely, you know, you don't want poop in the garden. So you're going to find a way to scoop that up with your shovel and discard it. But um, a little bit of, you know, if you saw a little, a little bit of pee on some leaves, is not going to be a big deal, generally. Okay. Um, last question. So they can burn holes in the fabric um, and they can also cut holes into the fabric? Yes. So though, just to note that the fabric is woven. So it's like this kind of like pattern where it's the threads going this way and threads going this way. So if you're cutting holes, you're gonna, it, it may like tatter and fray. So that's the benefit of the burning is it actually kind of um, melts it a little bit. So it, it won't fray. Okay. Okay, so this is the last question from Odessa regarding wood chips. She read that certain types of wood chips like walnut and atlas tree inhibit plant growth by causing an allelopathic right. <laughs> chemical response. Right, right. So yes, black walnut and I, I think maybe you said Atlantis. Uh, a tree of heaven so black walnut if uh, it's very very uh so black walnuts are trees um that even if you try and garden near them the the roots give off this chemical the like she was saying allelopathic which is i think it's called juglone um not juggalo but jug juglone um so uh but but at, but also black walnut trees, if they were to be cut down, are very very valuable. Like very valuable. Like the people, the wood is worth money. People have issues with people cutting black walnut trees down on their property and stealing it. Um, so it would be pretty uncommon for you to have a you know cause for putting black walnut mulch on your garden. Atlantis trees. Uh, are definitely weed trees and definitely uh, I, I guess I never heard that they had that um, quality to them but typically I would say by and far most of the mulch that we're getting um, from tree services or if we purchase it is either maple oak pine you know or, or in in you know in, in some maybe some of the other evergreens but like for the most part it's going to be maples and oaks and maybe, you know, box elders, which is in the maple family and so on and so forth. But I would say as a general statement, most of the wood mulches would not be of concern um, for those qualities. Um, but, you know, it's cause for you to look into Atlantis and, and see the tree of heaven uh, to see if that's a, prob a, prob a potential problem. Okay, great. Do you have time for a couple of more questions or you want to uh, circle back to these? Uh, okay, two more and let's go. Okay, we got two more. <laughs> All right, so how would you amend the soil if you are using a fabric? Do you have to remove the fabric and then put it back down or can you jump treat the area where the holes are cut? Or no, you them? would probably want to um, amend, like pull the plastic back and amend at least once a year. And uh, Vanetta, I'm assuming the KGP, uh, that's the Garden Resource Program, wood chips, okay for rain gardens with native plants? Yes. Okay. All right, that was it. Okay. So now we've talked, you know, we talked about what plants need to grow. We've talked about some tools for watering and their pros and cons. We've talked about some conservation strategies for watering. And now let's talk about how much, you know, based on knowing how that, uh, you know, the general guideline of needing one inch of water a week, um, how many gallons does my water, my garden need, you know? 
Um, and this on some level can help you maybe, you know, if you're really trying to be efficient with your home watering, um, you can, this can help you have a sense of like how much water you're actually using uh, in the garden. Um, so um, we're going to do some math here um, in this case. And if you want, you know, if you have in your mind, uh, if you if you have a piece, you want to grab a scrap piece of paper and you have a general idea of how wide and how long your garden is, we can do a little calculation here and figure out the square footage. Hold on a second. It's crazy. Um, all right. So, um, so in this case, even though this is a rectangle, we're saying that this garden is 20 foot by 20 foot. Um, and so that we're going to use this as an example. Um, so if you have your scrap piece of paper, maybe you could write down how, uh, how wide and how long your garden is, and then uh, multiply those two together to get the square footage. Okay, so in this case, our uh, strangely rectangular 20 foot by 20 foot garden bed is 400 square feet. All right. So uh, based on our conversation earlier, we know that gardens need um, one inch a week. And so we're going to use that. Uh, we're going to say for a month, we that would be four inches a month. Um, and to calculate the, the total, to convert that number into gallons, um, we're going to do another a little calculation here. So we're going to take that first number of our square footage, and then we're going to multiply that by 0.623, which is a conversion factor uh, to convert to gallons. And then we're going to multiply that by four, which is, you know, four weeks in a month. And that's going to give us how many gallons of water my 400 square foot garden is going to need per month. So in this case, um, uh, for this example, we, I need almost nine, my garden if if there if the run if the if mother nature was not raining at all in this garden at all, all the watering was was one hundred percent dependent upon me and putting me putting the water guard down on the garden. Um, it would it would be take uh, almost a thousand gallons of water out of my water spigot. Okay, but we know that we you know mother nature helps us out. Um, and so we can look at our average uh, rainfall in our, in, during the grows, growing season. So we're, gonna, we're basically referencing April through October. Um, and we can see we get two to three, an average of two to three inches a month. Now, um, it gets a little bit more complicated than this just because like, this is just for like some general guidelines. There is so slightly complicated and talk about it for a second. Um, you know, we get, we've, we're going to, with the effects of climate change, um, one of those effects is uh, really inconsistent uh, weather events and sometimes really intense weather events. So like, for example, last summer we had, what was it, six, almost, maybe almost two months, six weeks to uh, two months of, of little to no rain. Um, so that, you know, <laughs> we helped in same, install some rainwater catchment systems last year. And, you know, I was talking to some of the growers and I'm like, well, it hasn't even filled up yet because like just the way the timing went, like <laughs> there hadn't been any rain events, no rain, no rainwater to catch. <laughs> But that aside, we're we're just trying to look at scenarios and get a, a a good working idea of how much rain we're actually trying, you know, how much water we would actually need above and beyond what Mother Nature is going to provide. So, if, for that reason, um, we're just going to for for simplicity's sake, we're going to say that Mother Nature, in 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 our neck of the woods, Mother Nature 
is gives us two to three inches a month. And so we're going to say that she gives us about 50% of our water needs. So we're going to take our calculation of 996.8 gallons or basically a thousand gallons and divide times it by five or, or divide it in a half. And so that brings us to the number of, that's actually the water that we need to figure out, like either whether it be from our house or our neighbor's house or a rainwater collection system. If we don't have access to, you know, mother nature's taking care of half of the bill and we got to figure out the other half. Um, so that is, um, so that is, um, that's how we're going to start to figure out how to size the rainwater collection system. And so we're starting to think about uh, talking about rainwater collection. Um, this is this is the the math that we need to do to help us figure out how big we want our tanks to be to satisfy the needs of our garden. Um, so. Now we're talking about the rainwater collection systems. So we're, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about calculations in a minute, but um, let's just talk about the rainwater catchment systems and their pros and cons. Cons. Um, the pros are its ability ability to uh, have water available independent of city water systems. I think everybody that's quite clear to everybody, um, you know, definitely, uh, but. Uh, you know, there's a few, um, uh, you know, in addition to that, the, we, the rainwater collection system um, also really helps to divert rainwater out of our overtaxed sewage system, which we're going to talk a little bit more about a minute in a minute. Overall, rainwater collection systems are pretty easy to set up. Some of the cons are uh, which we've talked about a little bit, that low water pressure. And uh, so you either need some kind of pump, pump for the situation or a low flow drip irrigation or just plan to be watering with watering cans. Um, definitely worth noting that the water is not potable and should only be used to water at the soil level. So, you know, the water like birds are pooping on these roofs and, you know, there's other kind of, um, you know, things that are kind of, the, the, the water is not sterilized at all. So, you know, over time, the, it, it can have um, some potential problems with it. Uh, so the main strategy to address that is to not use it to wash your vegetables, but using it to water specifically in the root zone. Um, and there are, uh, and, and that said, there are a few things like if you want to do um, to sterilize the water or or to uh, prevent it from having any kind of vector of health issues, you can uh, do a very small application of bleach. I think it's something to the neighborhood of like a, a tablespoon per 50 ga gallons. Um, put it in the water, mix it up. It'll sterile do a little bit of killing of bacteria and sterilizing and you know it'll off gas some of the, the, the residuals uh, similarly to how we have chlorine in our water system um, for city water um so Naja, if you could uh drop this chat this uh this link in the chat for the safety use safety and use tips this is a reference guide that we have on our website um, for future reference um, I'm talking a lot of the talking, you know, I'm referencing a lot of the talking ponds here, uh, here in the class, but I just, if, if you wanted to have this for future reference, here it is. So I just want to spend a few minutes just talking about like how our city's combined system sewer system overflow works and um, that we're, you know, partially, if we're doing random water collection, how we're helping address um, kind of the issues with our, our water system here in the city of Detroit. Essentially, um, the same underground pipes that direct water and sewage away from your house also is connected to the street side water basin. So when it rains, so like basically when you flush your toilet and when you, um, you know, drain your bathtub, uh, it goes to the same system that is uh, 
is a is connected to the same system that captures the rainwater in our sewers and so on and so forth, which most of the time works out well. And then it goes on to the treatment plant is, you know, strained and treated and sterilized and then recycled to be used again. But if the, in certain, if the, if there is a big rain event, the, the, there's influx of water, which overwhelms the system and, um, can cause uh, sewage to overflow into our natural waterways, which is a big problem. It's a huge pollution issue. Um, so, um, uh, so we're really, you know, we're trying to limit uh, pervious surfaces in, like, in, or, or impervious surfaces are vectors or lanes for the water to go into the to the combined sewer system. So as the water washes off of the street, that that oil, the the car was just leaking oil that goes into the combined sewer system. And if it if a big rain event happens, then that those chemicals, motor oil, fertilizers, whatever, end up in our waterways, affecting um, impacting the wildlife, impacting um, our ability to you know to use those waters to swim in and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, just one more reason that rainwater collection is a positive thing. And here's a little more Ill image of like what was happening in that situation when it's overwhelmed. Um, I also want to just, uh, so the, the other thing I wanted to share uh, just a quick briefly is um, we did a little bit of a research project on how, uh, you know, how rainwater collection uh, can positively impact uh, the city of Detroit's uh, uh, combined sewer system. Um, so uh, there, we posed some qu research questions and worked with a number of farms. So the questions were, how can urban agriculture uh, be integral part of stormwater management? How can we quantify rainwater harvesting as a stormwater management technique? And how can we quantify a local water balance and evaluate uh, the amount of rainwater being captured, treated by urban agriculture? Um, so here's a few sites that we we did the testing at. Uh, this was, I think, three or four years ago now. And some of the takeaways were: uh, it's really a, a great rainwater. Uh, management strategy, um, but just water needs to be used. So that's a good uh, time to just to, you know, it's an interesting kind of dichotomy that um, we're interested in capturing rainwater to water our gardens. We get, you know, we fill our rainwater tanks in a big rain event. So that means um, we just got rain in our garden and we just filled all our tanks. And so we're gonna hold on to that water until we need it. And sometimes if there's an extended period of time, a couple of weeks that we don't use that water, um, and then we get another rain event. So you have to, to be this, to, for this to be effective, you have to actually you know use up the water in between. If you have something like uh, a hoop house or an unheated greenhouse, that's not a problem. You're gonna need all the water you can get because mother nature's not helping you inside of that structure. Um, but it's just, it is an interesting point. Um, and then raised beds, uh, and then just another factor is that garden beds are really efficient at uh, at store at collecting and storing water. So farm, so far our farms are actually essentially water sinks in a sense. Like uh, they because of because we are applying a compost, we're fluffing up the soil. So compost is a really great at absorbing and holding on to water. So farms as a as a general, in addition to rainwater collection systems, farms themselves are really a great uh, absorber of, of rainwater um, in, you know, in uh, helping divert water from the collected rainwater systems or collected drainage systems. Um, 
Uh, I think we're just kind of repeating some of the same stuff. Agricultural, cultural soil is demonstrating higher amount of water retention um, because of organic matter. Okay. Um, okay, so now let's just spend a minute talking about you know, sizing. And so I'm actually, I should have, so let's, you know, capturing rainwater from existing roof. Okay. But the, and so um, now that, you know, we back here, we talked about, uh, we had our make-believe garden, which was uh, 400, uh, 400 square feet. And we figured out that we needed approximately, after mother nature helped us out, we needed about 500 gallons of water. Uh, to to you know cater to the those plant, the, the our gardening needs, um, so if we're in a situation that we are trying to capture rainwater to supply all of our gardening needs, um, then we need to think about uh, um, essentially the 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 quick and dirty way to do it. Well, I'll, actually, let's do the calculation first. So basically you're using the same, um, you can use the same calculations uh, to, to measure a square, the square footage of a, an existing roof to figure out how much water potential you could uh, capture from a roof. So if my garage is 30 by 30, uh, or in this case, the example here, the uh, I have a 15 foot by 15 foot shed, and that's 225 square feet, then, um, you know, with a month's potential rainfall and the roof square footage, I could get, I could capture upwards of 280 gallons of water. So we're, again, so we're basically taking the square footage of the roof, multiplying it by our conversion factor of 0.623, um, and then uh, using, you know, what we anticipate the watering for we're going to get the rainfall we're going to get for a month is and that's going to tell us how much rain we might expect in a month's time from if we were trying to capture rainwater uh collect it uh from that roof um <clears throat> so um to state the obvious uh, in some ways but the bigger the roof the more rainwater you can capture right so um you know, uh, Mr. Walton, I can see Mr. Walton here. I know that he's got some unheated greenhouses over at his site. And those are huge roofs that he could put, in theory, he could put a gutter system on and capture in one, like in one rain event, he could capture upwards of 500, 700 gallons of water, um, you know, if he had the, the, the big enough tanks to do that. So, um, all right. So, uh, you know, best case scenario is capturing off of in a, if you are really interested, if you're in a situation where you don't have access to city water, the first and best option is, is there a big roof? Is there some kind of roof nearby that would be, you know, that you have access to, to capture rainwater from? Because the roof on a building is going to be much bigger than what a freestanding structure, um, you know, like our rainwater, like our irrigation stations. Um, uh, and you're going to be able to capture much more water. That said, you know, not every situation has that as an, as an option. So that's why we put together this design for the the rainwater, the rain, uh, the irrigation station or the rainwater. Uh, we we call this the irrigation station. Um, and so this, we try to come up with like a very simple, you know, it's it kind of, uh, but, you know, functional uh, setup where it's a lean to roof with a gutter at the back. So the is a sloped roof with the it's tilted towards the back, the gutter on it, and that, and then we have, you know, then there's tanks that are, are gathering that water. Um, so these are uh, this irrigation station. Um, uh, I, we have a manual for it on our website, and uh, Naja, if you could please drop the link for that in the chat. Um, so there's a manual uh, including materials, um, 
I'm uh, in the process of refining the design a little bit to make it slightly, um, just use a little bit less materials and have a you know the same kind of roof, bigger big roof size and bigger roof impact and bigger impact. Um, we you know we've installed uh, I don't know twenty or thirty of these uh, around the city um, in the past you know half, six or eight years and um, they're, they're working out really well. Um, they also work really they're really functional in a garden as a shade spot or a wash pack area um, or you know a gathering area in the farm. Um, so um, in terms of materials. The one on the left here is somewhere in the neighborhood of, I think it's eight or nine hundred dollars in materials, based on the last time I looked at, excuse me, lumber costs. And the one on the right here is going to be, um, you know, more like twelve to fourteen hundred dollars in materials um, when it's all said and done. Um, so. Um, as I and then I as I kind of alluded to, you could also do a really good job of rainwater collection off of hoop houses or high tunnels. Um, this is uh, some images of uh, the rainwater collection that we have at the KGD farm. Our greenhouses are um, so basically what, how you do it. And I actually probably should have some better close up images, um, but I can definitely if this is something that interests you. Um, you can contact me and I can either share some pictures or you can come by the farm sometime and check it out. But these are basically where we install gutters at like the shoulder height, um, which go to, we have, in this case, we have four 1100 gallon tanks at the, uh, you know, two at the back of each of our greenhouses. And then we sloped the gutter from the front, uh, from the street side to the back of the farm where the tanks are at works out pretty good. We have to take the gutters down every year um, because uh, snow load. So when snow accumulates on the top of the greenhouse, it's slowly, after it starts to warm up, it'll slide off. And in that case, it would just tear the gutters off. So we got to take them out every fall. So um, being that in mind, having that in mind, we use, we just use the vinyl gutters um, from Home Depot. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so, um, this is more details that's on that rainwater safety checklist that I was referencing earlier. Definitely want to uh, highlight that the, you know, I repeat again, that water, your rainwater that you collect is not potable and should not be drink or drink. Um, we usually also paint or uh, paint the outside of any tank if it's a if you're getting like a 275 gallon tote. Definitely would recommend uh, painting it with a dark color to limit light exposure to the inside, and that helps slow or prevent uh, algae growth over time. Um, and. And then just to, yeah, uh, we talked about this a little bit, but we don't want to extend store water for extended periods of time. And if you have to do that, you, you want to sanitize it. Okay, and now we are on to some of the resources. Um, so for totes, tanks, and barrels, um, uh, there is, I don't, you know, there used to be a few different locations around town um that you could purchase uh either the 55 gallon drums or the 275 gallon tanks or totes or um uh and then or uh but uh the they're the one moved out of the city maxi container they i think you can still get 55 gallon drums from from them um but their prices are kind of expensive worth checking into um I definitely craigslist and facebook marketplace are really good avenues for sourcing um if you are getting uh used uh 
55 gallon drums or 275 gallon totes, make sure that they are food grade and they didn't store nasty things like diesel fuel or oil or you know any kind of chemicals um, that could could leach into the water once it's sitting in the tanks. If you are interested in like larger tanks, um, like similar to the 1100 gallon ones that we have at the KGD farm, um, National Tank Outlet is pretty awesome. They have, uh, uh, we, uh, they have several outlets throughout the country. Um, you can do pricing on their website and they have different sizes of tanks and different um, kind of applications. They also have different colors and stuff. Um, you can get a pretty good side, good idea of pricing on their website. Um, uh, uh, generally, just to speak of pricing, on uh, I usually I've seen fifty-five gallon drums anywhere from fifty to seventy-five dollars. Um, sometimes you can get totes for as little as seventy-five. I've seen them as much as one hundred and fifty or two hundred. Um, so it's worth shopping around. And then um, we were talking, you know, in terms of, we were talking about drip irrigation. So if you're interested in checking out more drip uh, options for drip irrigation, um, check out Trickle Ease with this funny spelling, T-R-I-C-K-L dash E-E-Z, uh, their website, or also Dripworks. Uh, those have, they both have uh, lots of different options uh, and then they, and they both have kits for small scale. And then uh, low flow drip irrigation, we mentioned before, but here's the website, uh, Chapin Living Waters. I guess, Naja, if you wouldn't mind typing those uh, those websites in the chat so that people can access them a little more easily. Um, and then uh, in terms of pumps, uh, we use, at, at, we've used the, we, I've used the different, so several different types of pumps. Um, and tried some different ones, uh, but really love these ones from rain, rainharvest.com. They're specifically designed for irrigation. They can definitely push, they have good pressure, so they can they can push the drip irrigation system, they can push oscillators and all any kind of any kind of watering needs. They work great. Uh, they work just like city water um, in terms of power and pressure. And with that. Um, if you have further questions uh, or after today, here's my email address, but we got a little time left here. So I'm going to, uh, we can, um, we can open it up to questions. So I guess we'll start with what's in the chat. And then if uh, anybody wants to come off mute, we can kind of make it more conversational. Right. Okay. Uh, we can go ahead and do that now because I know Odessa did have a question she wanted to direct to you about her Atl Atlantis trees. So Odessa, you can go ahead and speak directly to Keto. Thank you so much. This has been really valuable. All of KGD's classes are incredibly valuable. I really appreciate all the work you all do. Um, it's just such a phenomenal program. I'm constantly blown away at how much you all do. Anyway, I just wanted to um, Thank you. Send some flowers your way to all Appreciate of you, KGD. Um, uh, my question is in regards to those Atlantis trees um, or tree of heaven. Um, so the um, alleo, alleopathic chemical response that takes place, I uh -huh. did look it up and Atlantis trees are high in that. Um, so I'm having some removed tomorrow uh -huh. and I potentially have access to a lot of wood chips. However, um, I don't know if I want to retain them or not, if it's going to um, um, inhibit uh, the plant growth, right. um, if I put it around on the beds for as mulch. Um, right. I will be using it for some of the lawn to eradicate some of the lawn and transfer some of that and then remove yeah. them once that's done. But for the garden beds is what my question is about, like, right. um, even just being in close proximity, you know, around the plants will it inhibit their growth because they do um, uh, cause that chemical response. Okay, well, I learned something today. Um, I would say in that case, 
uh, that I would not put in your garden beds. I would use, I mean, it's still usable. It would be, it's still gonna, they're still gonna um, suppress weeds and, um, you know, but I would just, if you have an application for using for paths um, or for, I, mean, I guess that's the biggest thing, particularly like if you're, if you're looking to do um, uh, paths, I would say use those in that application. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh. All righty. And I see uh, Ugami. Did you want to go ahead and ask uh, Keto your questions now? I see you wanted to talk afterwards, but the floor is open now if you wanted to jump in now. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, Kido. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for, for the presentation. It was wonderful, it was so informative. And uh, we appreciate you all. Uh, I think I'll call uh, Kido. <laughs> my my question is totally uh, irrelevant to the education stuff today. Okay. He knows what he knows what it is. I'll call him. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you so okay. much. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So the next question would be from Dr. Sean. Uh, can can full grade peroxide be used to sterilize water? I don't know. It seems reasonable uh, and maybe expensive. Uh, I I think that yeah I I don't have experience with that. I, um, I think you could probably do a little bit of internet research to get some answers to that question. I, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer. Okay. All right, uh, Alicia, I see your hand up. Go ahead with your question. Hi, Kiro. Thank you for the uh, education this evening. My question is on, you talked about uh, germination earlier and putting a weighted board over the seeds. Would I do that for the outdoor process as well? That was, I'm going to be clear here. That was specific to carrots. Okay. That's because they require a long germination period. Okay. I've um, seen it done with other plants. Right. So you can experiment with other plants. You just need to be so use your seed packet or your or a seed catalog. You just for that any particular crop on the seed packet or in the seed catalog, it will tell you days to germination. If it says 14 days to germination, you know that you got an extended period of time. If it tells you five days to germination, are you going to get out there again? Are you going to get out there in four days? Or are you going to get out there in seven days? If you get out there in seven days, you're going to have some very light, hungry plants. Yeah, got it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, yeah, thank you, Keto. Okay, I see your hand up, Penny. Give me... a. Uh... Two more people in front of you, then I'll come right to you. Uh, we have another question. Is a pump required to transfer rainwater from a rain barrel or a larger catchment system to the vegetable garden? If so, do you have any tips uh, about or for that during power outages, if there was ever a power outage? The only way that the water is gonna get from the from any kind of rainwater tank, barrel, whatever, to the garden is either if you use a pump or if you use a watering can, or I guess you could, or if you're using the low flow drip irrigation, right? So, um, uh, if you are in that situation and you have a power outage, then you're probably gonna have to use a watering can, or, I mean, we didn't talk about solar. Of course, solar is going to be an option here, but solar is getting more reasonably priced, but it's still not cheap. Um, so, but you know, solar would be an option. Or I guess, you know, there are kind of other avenues that you can explore for power other than solar um, or kind of a adjacent to solar, which would be like, um, I, one of the gardeners, John Miller in the garden research program, uh, he, his farm is 
Um, he doesn't have water on his farm, and he um, trans. He has a, a old um, boat trailer that he put a two two hundred seventy five gallon totes on, and he fills those up. He transfers rainwater that he collects at home into those totes, and then he's got when he gets to the farm, he's got a setup with a car battery and an inverter, which allows him to plug in a pump um, to power it to water the garden. Um, so, you know, there's our, there are techniques out there um, for that purpose. Okay. Okay. Um, next up is uh, Shaki. Uh, Shaki, you can go ahead and ask uh, your question. Do we still have a Shaki on the call? Well, her question, she has a uh, large totes attached to her house. And she was saying, do you, um, how do you prevent theft? Like, do you have any tips on um, yeah. how to chain them down? Yeah. Um, when we, um, when we do the setups for, like when we do the builds for the irrigation stations, we set them up on stands. Um, and uh, when we uh, when we put them on the stands, I drill holes in the base of the stand, and 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 do and screw, um, you know, do like uh, four or six screws and screw it to the stand. That's one. Um, that's one method. The other method is like if there's if it's full of water or at least half full of water, it ain't going nowhere. Um, you know, unless. I guess if they have the patience, they can undo, like open up the spigot, drain it out and then steal it. But um, I think, uh, you know, and then I've seen other people because all those, those big tanks have cages. Um, I've seen also pe see, seen people um, uh, use chains and like chain through the cage that holds the tank in and, and can either, you know, to a building or to something. So well, those are the few ideas. Okay. All right, Kenny, you can go ahead with your question. Hi. Yeah. So I, I container garden. Uh huh. And so the calculations that you did for the container. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not so it's just like, it's like inches, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what happened last year was I think I just like drowned all my plants. Okay. All my that's vegetables. You, you feel like that's what happens to you? Yes. I put too oh. much water on them. I almost right. watered them almost like every day. Right. So if you're dealing with containers, overwatering is a result of water of watering too much but it also has to do with the soil or the what you use in the pots so um you know generally what we recommend for if you're growing in containers do, is I, I mentioned this i think earlier but to do uh, like 50 percent compost and 50 percent potting mix um if it's garden soil that you use then uh uh um it, it'll tend to compact and not have good air and it'll tend to hold on to too hold on to water too much and be a prob problem you know like sounds like maybe what you're dealing with um so i would you know explore that and um i mean if you're if if you know usually containers the issue is that they dry out too quick so i would do a combination of maybe explore a different soil mix um and then you know back off on the watering a little bit and you don't want the plants to be especially once they're plants they're not seeds anymore you don't want them to uh get over watered you don't want that. You don't want to keep the soil constantly wet. You need to let it dry out a little bit between for air to get into the soil because the roots need that air. 
you know, so what, what was happening to me was, is that the plants would be drooping. And so because they were drooping, I would assume that they needed water. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a normal. Yes. That sounds right to me. Yeah. So, but my plants, Ooh, they had a hard time with the harvest. Right. You know, um, <laughs> it sounds like I would just experiment with doing things a little bit different. You know, since you are doing containers, maybe try a, like if you have several containers, try, uh, you know, watering this, do a little bit of experimentation on watering this one a little bit less, changing the soil mix on this one. And then you can start to get a sense of, oh, this, this, when I do this with this one, that the plants look much healthier and happier. I'm going to do that with all my plants. So it's definitely, um, it's definitely something that, you know, gardening is very much about observation and learning, you know, trying things out, observing the results and, you know, adjusting based on your successes. Okay. So you said that um, try initially 50% compost and 50% garden soil? No, potting soil. No garden soil. Oh. Don't put garden, don't dig soil out of your yard and put it in pots. Do not do it. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. And let me ask you, there's something called Burma. Uh-huh. Worm composting? No, ver it's a V-I-R-M kind of soil that they yes. add. It, so it's worm castings. Yes. Okay. That's, that's uh, kind of on par with compost. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, good luck to us. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So we are at the end of class. It's a little after eight. Um, if you have any more questions, you can email your questions to me or to Keto. I did send out an email that had our um, email links in there as well. I'll put that in the chat so you can email with any more questions. Keto, would you like to end with anything else? No. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming out. Um, I guess just to note that if you did apply for the WaterWise program, we are in the process of reviewing applications um, over the next week or so. Um, we will be in touch soon. And uh, and if you have any questions in the meantime, um, drop me an email. All righty, that's the end. We'll be sending this out to you soon. We'll see you next time. Everybody have a good night. All right. Good night, all. Good night. Good night, all. Bye-bye. Good night.